Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Michael Link. I'm a law professor in Canada. I'm also the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights in the Palestinian territories occupied since 1967. And I'm acting as the moderator for today's uh, Zoom meeting uh, that has been organized by the European Coordination of Committees and Associations for Palestine. Uh, there will be four speakers today. I will begin and I will talk a little bit about the issue of accountability, annexation and settlements. Um, we are joined today by Dr. Anna Kader, who is a researcher and advocacy officer with Al Haq, which is a Palestinian human rights organization based in Ramallah. After her, we will have to, uh, Professor Tom Morenhut, who is a professor at Columbia University's School of Public and International Affairs, and he has published on third state uh, obligations relating to settlements. And finally, we are joined by Ms. Claire Daly, who is an Independence for Change member of the Irish Parliament for eight years and has been elected to the European Parliament from the Dublin constituency as one of Ireland's 13 members of the European Parliament. Uh, after that, once all the speakers have spoken, we will have a short time for, uh, for questions, um, which you can add through the, uh, through the chat box function. As I said, I've been asked today to speak about the issue on accountability and what the international community might do considering the countermeasures in the face of Israel's plans to, to for formally annex further parts of the West Bank, including all of the 240 Israeli settlements in the West Bank. In the few issues, in the few minutes that I have, I want to address three issues. One is the political meaning of impunity in the Israeli occupation, particularly with respect to annexation and settlements. The second are the calls for accountability by the United Nations. And the third are the specific accountability measures that could be on the menu for the international community. First, let me speak to the issue of impunity. There is no occupation in the world today where the international community has been so alert to the many grave breaches of international law, so knowledgeable about the occupier's obvious and well-signaled intent to annex and formally establish permanent sovereignty, so well-informed about the scale of suffering and dispossession endured by the protected people under occupation, and yet so unwilling to act upon the overwhelming evidence before it to employ the plentiful political and legal tools at its disposal to end the occupation. On two prior occasions, Israel took formal steps to annex illegally territory under its uh, occupation, um, including uh, East Bank, the East Jerusalem in 1980, and the uh, Syrian Golan Heights in 1981. On both occasions, the Security Council emphasized the illegality of uh, annexation through its resolutions. It demanded that Israel comply with its directions to undo the annexations, and it promised to examine further measures respecting Israel's conduct should it not comply. As well, the United Nations has passed a number of resolutions uh, at the Security Council with respect to the illegality of the Israeli settlements. Uh, it began its first um, uh, resolutions in 1979 and its most recent resolution in 2016, Resolution 2334, emphasized that the uh, Israeli settlements are illegal, they are in breach of the Fourth Geneva Convention, and they sh uh, all settlement buildings should be stopped and the settlements should, uh, should be reversed. Alas, with respect to annexations and with respect to settlements, no effective steps were ever taken by the United Nations or the international community against Israel, nor have there been any meaningful steps um, to, with respect to Israel for its refusal to obey any of the numerous Security Council and General Assembly resolutions with respect to its many violations of human rights. From all this, Israel has learned an invaluable lesson. The UN and the international community may criticize Israel on occasion for its clear and ongoing defiance of international law and the international consensus. But the world is exceptionally hesitant to imposing political, diplomatic, and economic costs on Israel for doing so. It is highly doubtful that we'd be here speaking today about Israel's looming annexation and its uh, building of 240 settlements on the West Bank if the world had drawn real lines in the sand 40 years ago or 20 years ago or even five years ago. Resolutions without resolve and criticism without consequences are a small price that Israel will happily pay if it means that its trade, 
investment and political status with Europe, North America, and the rest of the world will continue on as before. In a comment that aptly applies to the wider world, the former European Union <clears throat> Special Representative for the Middle East, Miguel Moratinos, stated in 2010 with respect to the Israeli occupation, quote, we Europeans excel at declarations. It is compensation for our scarcity of action. My second point is that becoming serious about accountability is the last and best hope for turning around this calamitous situation. There is much to say on this issue of accountability, but not with the time that we have this morning um, to be able to speak with you. I may point out that if anybody in the audience is interested in a detailed review of the legal and political responsibilities that the international community carries to end a situation such as this 53-year-old occupation, you may wish to look at my most recent report as Special Rapporteur, which focuses on accountability that was delivered to the UN Security Council, UN General Assembly in October 2019. Let me simply make one point here. There is a startling disparity in the way in which the international community reacted to the Russian annexation of Crimea in 2014 and its approach to the two annexations undertaken by Israel 40 years ago and its continued defiance today. Within weeks of the Russian invasion and annexation, and with the UN Security Council unable to act because of the Russian veto, many of the most powerful players in the world enacted swift and comprehensive sanctions against Russia, which included the diplomatic downgrading of relations, including banishing is, uh, Russia from the G8, the freezing of assets and the imposition of travel restrictions against targeted individuals, bans on the import and export of goods respecting Crimea and Sevastopol, an array of economic sanctions against Russia, and restrictions on economic cooperation. They were imposed on Russia notwithstanding that it is a significant international player politically and economically, that has a population of 145 million people, and that Europe absorbs significant co economic costs for taking these steps. Yet Israel, which is also illegally annexed territory, and which has faced censure on numerous occasions from the Security Council with respect to its building of illegal uh, Israeli settlements, has never faced accountability measures from the UN or the international community. But Nine million people had as only 6% of the Russian population, and it is heavily dependent economically and politically on the goodwill of Europe, North America, and Asia. Economic and political accountability measures from the international community is what the uh, Israeli leadership fears the most, and liberal uh, Israelis have repeatedly made this point. As Amos Shokin, the publisher of Al Haratz, the Israeli Daily wrote in 2016, with respect to the potential of serious measures coming from the international community, and I quote, the Israeli leadership will only will object and protest, but it may be that international press pressure is precisely the force that will drive them to do the right thing. My third and final point goes to answering the question, what should be done? Let me suggest some accountability measures that have the potential for being quite effective with respect to Israel, not only to forestall annexation and uh, the continued building of its settlements, but to actually push Israel away from its destructive path and to open the door for a genuine peace, peace process that would end the occupation and enable Palestinian self-determination. Almost all of these measures have been employed in other conflicts with positive results. First, reviewing and downgrading existing and potential trade and cooperation agreements. With respect to the European Union, <clears throat> and Tom will speak more about this in a little while, it is permitted to suspend its principal agreements with Israel should there be a serious breach of common values, which includes human rights and international law. Second, downgrading diplomatic representation with Israel and recognizing the state of Palestine. Third, a refusal to allow settlement goods from entering the, Europe, the international marketplace without a certificate of approval from the Palestinian Authority. This would replicate the practice followed in a number of countries, including Crimea and Northern Cyprus. Fourth, prohibiting any of its registered companies and, and organizations from trading, investing in, donating, fundraising, or financially assisting settlements or the settlement economy. Fifth, imposing travel bans on Israeli settlement, settler leaders, those who are mayors and regional councillors, again, similar to the in, individual sanctions imposed in the aftermath of the Crimean annexation, and six, supporting the UN um, Human Rights Council's database on Israel 
on uh, and international business involved in the occupied territories by resourcing the database as a living tool to capture the support system that provides the economic oxygen to the uh, Israeli settlements. To sum up, let me say that this five year, five decade long occupation is not going to die of old age. Israel has the ability to maintain the status quo indefinitely into the future in the absence of meaningful international cooperation and action. It is sometimes said by critics of Europe's foreign policy towards Israel and Palestine that it suffers from paralysis and an action. Nothing could better demonstrate that this argument is misplaced than for the international community led by the European Union to back up its criticism of um, Israel's occupation and looming annexation with a decisive measure of a decisive menu of countermeasures. As it did with the occupation of Crimea, member states of the United Nations can prove that defying international law can only come at a significant cost to the perpetrator. That's the best hope and perhaps the last hope in the foreseeable future that justice may be salvaged and peace may remain on the agenda. Thank you. And I'll now turn to Anna for her comments. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation uh, to this excellent panel. I will be speaking in, on behalf of Al Haq, Palestinian human rights organization, who is, uh, for several years uh, was documenting on, and monitoring human rights violations and business uh, connections and links uh, in the op uh, occupied Palestinian territory. So firstly, I wanted to focus to, uh, on the content of the database. And secondly, I want to share what can be a lesson learned and recommendation, how we can use the database and why the annual updates and continuation of the development of the database are crucial for its purpose as uh, a tool of for corporate accountability. While discussing uh, the database, uh, and involvement of business and human rights violations in the OPT, we should keep in our mind the overarching uh, fr uh, frameworks of, uh, first of all, Israeli prolonged occupation resulting in widespread and systematic human rights violations, deepening fragmentation of the Palestinian people and territories, including Israel's control over more than 60% of the West Bank territory known as Area C, and uh, plans for uh, further legal annexation of uh, large parts of the West Bank and control over all access points in and out of the OPT, as well continued denial of Palestinian sovereign, sovereignty over natural resources as a part of Palestinian right to development and self-determination. So first of all, the release of the database is accomplishment of the long-standing work of broad co coalition of actors from Palestine and all around the world. And it was an incredible cross-sectoral collaboration among civil society, human rights defenders, grassroots organizations, UN bodies and experts. And al Haq recognizes the importance of the database for the impo improvement of the human rights situation in the Palestinian context as well to ensure accountability and business responsibility for human rights abuse for human rights abuses this is particularly the case in con in the context of institutionalized oppression and domination and where imbalance of the power between those who profit from violation and those who pay the price of the human rights violation which are usually externalized and not included in the due diligence done by companies this is not only the case for the Palestinian people affected by the lack of transparency of business activities and the supply chain responsibilities for human rights impacts on the ground. As introduced by the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, OECD guidelines and other frameworks regarding steps for businesses to assess the account um, for uh, an account for how they cause, contribute and are directly linked to adverse human rights impacts and how they are how their activities and relationships may support or benefit from an unjust and discriminatory administration of the territory and its resources i would uh, recommend and maybe further in the chat i will add a link to a last recent publication on business and human rights in occupied territories done by al haq and global legal action network uh, which is uh, published recently 
So the database for us is a crucial for a global recognition of many vital links between sustaining businesses, uh, business activities in Israel's illegal settlements and Israeli annexationist practices towards the Palestinian people and the territory. And soon to be de jure annexation as we face the plans of the Israeli government for large parts of the occupied West Bank. Israel's illegal settlements are flourishing hubs for such a creeping de facto annexation. It is a high time to put an end to this illegality and ensure accountability. In 2013, the UN Independent International uh, Fact-Finding Mission on Israeli Settlements found out that, I quote, business enterprises have directly and indirectly enabled, facilitated and profited from the construction and growth of the settlements, end of quote. So in, this, uh, in the final list, which was released as a database, um, 112 companies were identified as a part of the annual report of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, published in mid-February of this year, ahead of 30, uh, 43rd regular session of the Human Rights Council, postponed due to the pandemic till 15th of June this year. And still, it's need to be addressed by the member state of the Human Rights Council. And in this discussion, we should not forget the purpose of the database and its role as a living document for a corporate accountability. Just a few words on the scope of the, of the database. So 18 international companies have been identified, including a large group of digital tourism companies, such as Airbnb, Booking.com, Expedia Group, TripAdvisor, eDreams, Odigo, and Opodo, which is British UK brand of the, fur, the latter one. From the construction sector, there are machinery and consulting services companies, and like GC Bamford Excavators, Agis SA, Agis Rail, Alstom, Altis Europe, Greencott, Tahal Group, and Cardan Indorama Ventures. Other sectors are also represented, like food distribution and mobile communication, through a listing Motorola Solution and General Mills. And these are the, only the international companies based in six countries, United States, six of them, Netherlands, four of them, in, U in the UK, uh, three of them, France also three, and Luxembourg and Thailand, uh, one in each of those countries. And all home states for these listed companies uploaded and promoted the commitment to upholding the UNGP's guiding principles on the protect, respect and remedy framework. However, some of them rejected the database for political reasons and needs to be reminded that the database is a tool for legal accountability. What's important, the rest of the 94 companies are Israeli companies who are active in Israeli illegal uh, settlements in occupied Palestinian territories. And it includes communication sector, transportation. Um, in terms of natural resources, we have listed the American Israeli Gas Corporation and Israeli water company Merkorot. Uh, for the communication sector, there are Cellcom uh, Israel, Motorola partner, uh, of course, we can all see the, uh, um, this in the list. And also Israeli banking sector is quite well represented, which is including uh, Bank Hapolim, Bank Lomi, Bank of Israel, Israeli Discount Bank, Mercantile Discount Bank as well. In those cases, which is um, interesting that Israeli branches or subsidiaries of uh, international holdings or parent or big corporation are more likely listed or are listed and not necessarily their international parent companies or holdings, which I think also needs a further exploration. And also, uh, th therefore, we have this need of, of, of development and um, updates of the, of the database in terms of exclusion, like inclusion and new companies which were omitted in, the, um, in this, uh, in this advent, uh, endeavor. So, we spotted several omissions, which are very crucial, and as Al-Haq and other civil society actors uh, were um, uh, contributing through their submission in the end of 2016 uh, to the research and procedure of, uh, of the preparation and production of the uh, database. So we noted several omissions, including various agricultural settlements, businesses and exporters, the lack of settlement wineries, 
gas companies operating pipelines off the coast of the Gaza Street and, as, uh, and also queries and the involvement of the companies like second biggest cement companies in, company in the world, Heidelberg Cement, which um, we soon will uh, also um, present a field visit into their, into their, into their um, endeavors in the occupied Palestinian territory. So what can we do with the, with the database and how we should use it? We definitely see that it is a call for accountability, transparency and quality reporting on the human rights impacts by companies. And they are taking place in different industries and different uh, countries. And usually they are requested from different marginalized and vulnerable groups like domestic workers, indigenous people, trade unions in supply factories, and all who are affected by business doings. Infor unfortunately, companies tend to focus on communication about socially responsible projects, not always addressing the core of their business activities. Some countries like France actually have national legislation for uh, due, di due diligence assessment and reporting uh, for certain uh, types of companies for their human rights impacts in their supply chain. And those impacts in the human, uh, human rights impact in the supply chain are actually something uh, which is uh, very important for hum enhanced human rights due diligence, which needs to be done by all the companies uh, by all the companies. And um, to conclude, I would like to just enforce the statement that it is important tool for accountability and increased transparency for business ac activities in context of prolonged human rights abuses, including conflict and occupation. It provides information not only about the companies who are involved, but also show how broad and deep is the involvement of the businesses in the legal settlements, even while considering the existing gaps I just mentioned very quickly. It is also a recognition of the illegality of business activities in the Israel settlements enterprise. And it is also a result of almost three years of extensive advocacy efforts, as well research analysis and documentation from the civil society and also efforts, former and current UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, and, its office, and his office and, complete, and to complete this task and to produce the database as a tool for accountability in quite volatile circumstances of harassment and smear uh, campaign against all the actors who are defending human rights of Palestinians. It is, uh, it is great accomplishment and we should, uh, businesses should take it into account as a source of information and tool for their enhanced due, dil due diligence, human rights due diligence, and further businesses should take it into account as well, as well home, home states, which I think we will be talking about it later a little bit. So thank you very much. I will be back with answer for the, your question if you have any. Thank you. And I thank you very much for that uh, that insightful presentation on the UN database and what it uh, actually tells us with respect to the settlement economy and what its potential might be in the future. I'm now going to ask Professor Tom uh, Morenhut uh, to be able to uh, to speak to us with respect to obligations of companies. Tom, over to you. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much, Michael, and thank you for the organization of the webinar. Um, we already had some technical challenges in the beginning, so the least I can do is uh save you from looking at another unshaven beard so i'm gonna pull out some slides which are going to make a few things easier so i'll talk about the international law issue right and actually what i'm mainly going to talk about is what are the obligations of the state and i i really want to make one thing very clear during this you know 10 15 minutes and that is if the slide wants to change yes stopping trade with settlements is not a sanction and i've i've mentioned this in, in in many talks and there's lots of documentation on this exact point and we're pushing this point as well it's not a point it's actually just uh, you know a legal analysis if you want we're pushing it with regards to several occupation related conflicts not just israel and palestine but generally it can be western sahara and morocco it can be past present and future stopping trade with settlements is not a sanction right to get to that let's quickly go through sort of 
uh, International Law 101, right? This triangle that you see there is the triangle of all types of laws that you can have, with on, which on the with on the bottom sort of the national laws, obviously, and at, top, at the very top, there's this thing called the Scorgans or peremptory norms of international law. What are those peremptory norms, right? They're sort of, you read it down there, um, the goal of these peremptory norms is for the protection of the fundamentals of humanity. Right? And that's where we can stop. So they include things as a prohibition on genocide, slavery, apartheid, war crimes, acquisition of territory by the use of force. Uh, they include the right to self-determination. They include uh, fundamental norms of international humanitarian law as well. So kind of assessing where we're at in terms of international law requires three steps. Number, number one being, do settlements violate peremptory norms of international law? And just for this particular presentation, we, we can take uh, Israelis, uh, the Israeli occupation in the West Bank um, and the Golan Heights, of course, as, as the example, right? So do these settlements violate peremptory norms of international law? Yes. I think this is incredibly easy to understand, right? There's a clear obstruction of the right to civil determination. There's acquisition of territory by the use of force. That was already going on with the settlements. Of course, the talks today about annexation um, kind of sort of just confirm what everybody already knew, right? This is nothing new. The annexation has been there de facto. Now it might just be there de, de, de jure, right? Number three, there is a violation of fundamental uh, norms of international humanitarian law. What is one of those fundamental norms? This is you cannot transfer the civilian population of an occupying state to the occupied territory which is pretty much the definition of settlements, right? So settlements go in against these fundamental norms. And number four, there's apartheid. So all in all, very easy question to answer. Do settlements violate peremptory norms of international law? Clearly they do. So we go to the, question, to the second question, right? Are there consequences for third states? Third states being European countries, being pretty much any country around the world, any jurisdiction, right? Of course, there are consequences for third states. Right. Um, this is recognized within uh, international law, the articles on state responsibility and the main sort of obligation in response of, and you can read it there in red, uh, a serious breach of peremptory norms is these duties, these obligations of non-recognition and non-assistance. Right. So this basically says that if there is a country, in this case Israel, who violates peremptory norms of international law, then other countries have an obligation to not recognize that uh, unlawful situation and to not assist its maintenance uh, of, of those breaches of those violations, right? This, in the case of Israel and Palestine, has been recognized in the United Nations resolutions. It has been recognized in the International Court of Justice, right? In earlier presentations at one point, both for the peremptory norms and for the fact that these duties of non-recognition and non-assistance have been recognized, I added a whole list of International Court of Justice, United Nations Security Council resolutions and so forth. I haven't done that now because it doesn't fit on one slide. Um, so just to say, if anybody wants a full list, I'm happy to, to share that list and I'm happy to share this presentation as well. So yes, there are consequences for third states, right? Duties of non-recognition and non-assistance, which by the way, uh, international law is very clear about, those duties apply when the breach, sort of the, you know, the breach of, of peremptory norms, so in this case by Israel, is, is both systematic or gross, you know, like very, very sort of grave. In the case of Israel, we have both very, you know, strong violations and the systemacy is, is, is very evident given that the settlement enterprise has been going on for, for decades uh, without any, any pause. The third question, and a very important question, of course, is so what do those not, obligations of non-recognition and non-assistance uh, include, right? And do they include trade? Now, on the side of non-recognition, right? And you need to look at those things as two different obligations. There's an obligation of non-recognition, there's an obligation of non-assistance. On the side of non-recognition, right? We can say very clearly, yes, they include stopping trade. They actually include, to be more precise, they include not starting trade, right? Um, not trading with them. Why? Because trading, of course, is, is implicit recognition, right? And here I take the example of the EU, which I think is the most, most apt example here. Um, 
to, to show you the logic of implicit recognition, right? The EU, you know, has a preferential trade agreement with Israel, right? The association agreement. They grant Israeli products from the sovereign territory of Israel, preferential access to the EU territory, right? Now, the EU has been very clear in saying, we do not give that preferential access, you know, those preferential tariffs and so forth. We do not give that to settlements because settlements are illegal under international law and they do not belong to the sovereign territory of the state of Israel. The European Union has been very clear about that. At the same time, they do grant them regular market access. And this is a perfect sort of example of, of implicit recognition, of course. Second duty, the duty of non-assistance, does that include stopping trade? Also, yes. And it's quite easy. We have World Trade Law, you know, World Trade Organization is uh, currently has more than 160 members. Um, it's very well recognized as sort of the universal law on trade. And there it says very clear that trade is aimed, and this is in the preamble, trade is aimed at raising standards of living and expanding the production of and trading goods and services. So it even explicitly links trade to expanding production um, and wealth. So here we can clearly see that settlement trade does not only help maintain settlements, it actually helps to expand them. And I think the, the database that, that I just spoke about is, is, is a very clear case in point, how you have a lot of businesses developing within settlements uh, or having uh, professional activities, corporate activity in settlements. And of course, those businesses can only do that when they have a place to export their products to, right? And this is in part to third countries like European countries and other countries. So having that type of trade for sure provides assistance. So then we get to the, 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 clear, the clear point that I, I really want to make in, in, in a few remaining minutes, right? There is an obligation to not trade, right? There is a very clear obligation to not trade with settlements. This is not something that countries can opt to do or not do. It is an obligation under international law. And why is that? It is because that trade with settlements should have never existed in the first place. The fact that it is there is just an, an indication of the non-compliance of third states with their obligations not to recognize and not to assist settlements. Trade should have not existed. So we're not talking here about sanctioning. We're talking about something that should have not existed and that needs to be rectified by making sure that countries comply with their obligations to not recognize those serious violations that Israel is doing, such as acquisition of territory by the use of force, annexation, prohibiting the right to self-determination, apartheid, and so forth. Here, I quickly want to, you know, sort of point it out before we get to, to slide on the European Union to conclude, right? To, because I really want people to take this away. If there's anything you take away from this presentation, sanctions, they are a positive obligation. What does that mean, a positive obligation? A positive obligation is, is under international law is basically an obligation that requires states to implement something, to do something positive. On the, up, on the other side of that, you have a negative obligation, which basically says to states something that they cannot do, right? So trading with settlements is actually a negative obligation. They are not allowed to do that. The fact it exists, again, is, is an indication of the non-compliance of third states. Right? Um, if, as Michael has mentioned, certain, certain measures, if you uh, cut certain diplomatic ties with people in Israel within the sovereign territory of Israel, so not the settlements, then this can be considered a sanction. And that is something, you know, if the UN Security Council requires you to do that, and that is a, a positive obligation, right? Um, same thing for sanctions. Sanctions can be mandatory if the UN Security Council decides that they are mandatory, right? Otherwise, countries, of course, have the complete right to implement sanctions. They have the right to take a political decision and implement the sanctions toward any territory, any conflict that they want, right? When we talk about trade with settlements, it's something else entirely. This trade should not exist, so it is an automatic and self-executing obligation. These duties of non-recognition and non-assistance do not need to be triggered by the UN, United Nations Security Council. Countries have those obligations themselves automatically. They don't need somebody else to tell them, hey, you need to stop trading with settlements, right? Third point, sanctions normally are 
targeted as, at a specific country, right? And they are withdrawn when that country stops the violation that, uh, you know, that, that is the reason for those sanctions. Yeah. Stopping trade with settlements is irrespective of country and time. The point is that countries should never trade with civilian settlements of the occupant in occupying uh, in occupied territories. It's as simple as that. So it doesn't matter whether we're talking about Israel or Palestine. It does not matter whether we're talking about Western Sahara or Morocco, Cyprus, um, or other occupation-related conflicts. This is a rule that should be very clear now and in the future, right? And that general rule is not going, you know, it doesn't matter whether the violation is stopped because the violation is stopped, you know, the settlement enterprise ends, right? So there's no more settlement enterprise to basically trade with. So what we have, and, and I'm going to conclude now, what we have is a very, very clear international obligation, right? So why doesn't it happen? And this is where we come and have to talk, of course, about the evasion of accountability, right? And this is basically how it works in the European Union, because we have, we have spoken about European Union. We know that European countries are far ahead or, you know, relatively far ahead compared to a certain other Western countries in trying to set up accountability measures. This is what is currently happening in the European Union, right? The obligations of non-recognition and non-assistance the obligation to stop, to not trade with settlements is an obligation that is incurred both by member states and the European Commission, all right? Member states are competent for customs and importation. The European Commission is competent for trade policy, okay? So normally we would expect the initiative to come from the European Commission, right? Um, and they have done that actually in certain other uh, territorial conflicts in the past. So they have referred to their own competence to say, we are going to, we are going to regulate trade with a certain uh, territory or, or, or products related to certain conflict, right? Now the European Commission is not doing that. So that means that member states should definitely act because member states retain the competence for customs and importation. The way this actually works is that the European Commission gives a list of postal codes to member states and says, these are postal codes from Israel proper. They get preferential access. These are postal codes that are not from Israel proper, i.e. settlements. They do not get preferential access, right? But they still get access to the market. And here member states should as actually have the obligation to say no. You know, here is where we stop those restricted, where we restrict this particular trade because we have to under international law. Importantly, when we talk about the evasion of responsibility, right? We see a lot of member states who say, we cannot decide it because the European Commission is competent for trade. That's a lie. And we see that the European Commission often says, we are not responsible because what we're discussing about here is a sanction and sanctions are decided uh, on by the European Council. Yeah, European Council is all member states together. So this will never happen, all right? This is also wrong because we're not even talking about the sanction here. We're talking about trade regulation. Right? So the European Commission has the competence to act, but chooses to evade responsibility by referring to the Council. Member states similarly have the obligation to act, and they choose to evade responsibility by referring to the European uh, Commission. Right? One last thing is that in all of this evasion of responsibility, one big question is, can member states really act on their own? And the answer is, Yes, very simply so. Not only have they the obligation to act on their own, to not trade anymore with settlements, they also have the explicit right under EU law to take any restrictive measures that they see, you, that, they see that are needed for basically public policy and public morale. So on the member states level, there is nothing, absolutely nothing that stops individual member states from stopping trade with settlements. On the European Commission level, what we obviously have is a huge amount of, of evasion and hypocrisy, right? When member states are going to initiate something, the Commission says, excuse me, this is our trade competence. And then when you push the European Commission, the European Commission says, hey, this is a sanction, this is European Council competence. So it is essential to clarify that role of the European Commission, to push them on their own responsibility. But fundamentally, where things really always change within the European Union, when, um, whenever there's an actual sort of compliance with international obligations, 
this starts with the member states. And I'll stop right there. Oh, that was uh, a wonderfully clear explanation of the legal duties on states to uh, to stop trade with the with the settlements. And I thank you for that. I'm now going to turn to uh, Claire Daly. Um, one of the most exciting uh, legislative possibilities um, in a number of years has come from the Irish uh, Irish Parliament, which which has been debating over the last several years the uh, uh, the existence of a occupied territories bill. And I'm going to invite Claire to speak about that. Please go ahead, Claire. Thanks very much, uh, Michael. I really appreciate the invitation. Uh, I was going to say I'm glad to be here, but obviously we're not really glad in the context that the backdrop to us being here is the continued persecution of the Palestinian people and the continued Israeli illegality with the settlements going uh, unchallenged. But that said, uh, it is great to be here in the context that the time for doing nothing uh, is, has to stop now. Uh, I think particularly given that the new Israeli government has been signed in explicitly stating their commitment to continue further annexation of large parts of the West Bank and they seem to be hell-bent on actually doing that uh, before the US elections. So I think in that context the Irish legislation points a very important way forward and actually takes into account a lot of the points that Tom was making there about what states can do. Um, firstly, I suppose, I, I'm sorry to say it's not my piece of legislation. It was moved by an independent colleague of mine, Senator Francis Black, uh, who I suppose shows the power of one, really, one person, an independent member, moving a piece of legislation called the Control of Economic Activity Occupied Territories Bill 2018, which seeks to end Irish trade in goods produced in the illegal settlements of the occupied territories. So as Tom said, this isn't a, a BDS piece of legislation. I have no problem with BDS, but this isn't this. This is simply upholding our obligations under international law. And when Francis moved the bill in that way, it got an enormous response from most of the political groupings in Ireland and hugely from uh, civil society and actually then had enormous um, positive uh, waves uh, across the world really, which shows that even a small country or a small group of individuals can be, bring a uh, very positive change. Uh, the legislation almost passed all stages in Ireland. The reason why it didn't is we had a general election in the meantime, which delayed its passage through the two final stages. But we are in the process now of government formation talks and all of the political parties and independents bar one political grouping supports uh, the idea of this legislation being fully enacted. So we're really optimistic that that can happen. Uh, it's probably more likely that that will happen than that we get a government, which hasn't happened uh, for a while. But look, they're in negotiations on that. But I suppose the first thing to say is I was in the Irish Parliament at the time uh, the bill was going through. And I remember making the point that isn't it sort of scandalous in some ways that we're actually clapping ourselves in the back about taking action against blatant illegality. And it shows really how normalized the settlements have become, how normalized the per persecution of Palestinians have become, because everybody knows they're illegal, but no action is taken uh, to deal with that. The situation for us and the argument, I think, that won the discussion in Ireland was, it's very simple. How can we condemn settlements as illegal and then happily buy the proceeds of that crime. It just doesn't make sense. It's an affront. And I think that uh, gained a lot of capital. We're culpable in families being kicked out of their homes, in farming and land being taken, uh, and so on, if we continue to buy uh, these products. So I think somebody asked the question, why hasn't this happened elsewhere? And I think one of the reasons is the uh, Israel lobby is obviously incredibly strong. They're allowed to do what they do because the US facilitates it, but particularly because the European Union stands idly by and is too quiet. I think we see that graphically illustrated last week when the yeah, European Council uh, foreign ministers met in, in light of the latest annexation statements and High, High Representative Burrell told us that the European Union was going to use all our diplomatic capabilities, uh, hardly uh, sort of, you know, groundbreaking stuff. Really what he was saying is we're going to let this continue and it's not sufficient. Um, international law, as Tom says, requires action. And in that context, when the objection was put forward, and I have to be honest, there was a huge campaign 
internationally by the Israeli state to try and undermine this bill. They put all European, all Irish political parties under pressure on it. But one of the myths put forward was that this was anti-Israeli, that it was anti-Semitic and that it was targeting uh, Israel. That's absolutely false. This piece of legislation is dealing with illegal occupations anywhere in the world, absolutely anywhere, if the evidence is there. It just so happens that the evidence is clearly there in Israel, Palestine, being confirmed endless times by the EU, the UN. So that's a total straw man. Another straw argument put forward by it was that, well, you look at Ireland can't act unilaterally to ban settlement trade. But as Tom said, it, it absolutely can. Under EU treaties, and there's been huge legal opinions sought to verify this, so you don't even have to just rely on Tom's word for it, but Ireland can introduce limited and proportional re uh, restrictions on things like settlement goods because they're produced illegally. In actual fact, not only can we do it, but we're obligated to do it under international law. So I think given that we all know the game that's played in the EU between the responsibilities between member states and the commission, we know the EU has huge leverage. And part of this, I suppose, has to be uh, people who are listening in here and people active on this issue, using that leverage to force the EU to do more. It's Israel's largest trading partner. It could warn Israel. It could refuse to sign new agreements. It could disassociate stop cooperation on programs like Horizon Europe, uh, the European Neighbourhood Instrument, whatever. It's important they do all that. But in the event that they don't, and that they continue the game they've been playing on this, member states can act. So it's good that 10 um, member states have now asked the European Union's diplomatic service to start analysing the relationship with Israel and to draw up options papers in terms of actions in this regard, which I think is obviously welcome. But it's not nearly enough. So I think anybody in any member state should be pressurising their own government to re-enact uh, or, or to do what Ireland is, is trying to do in uh, this regard. Because, you know, one of the other, I suppose, straw men put up was, I oh, well, should look at, uh, you know, what's the point in Ireland or any state acting alone? It's completely pointless. It's ineffective. We're only talking in Ireland's point of view about one million a year. So it's tiny, that's not going to bring the Israeli state to its knees, but it's incredibly interesting, the response that's been to that tiny legislation. So if it wasn't significant, I wouldn't be here talking about it. It's actually provoked people around the world into talking about it. Frances Black would tell that the reception that she got in Palestine and what a, a boost it was for citizens there, for trade union members, for ordinary people there was, was hugely significant and for activists all over the world. It was really, really heartening. So the fact that I'm here gives a lie to the fact that it doesn't make any difference. Um, but also that was the same argument put forward in the anti-apartheid movement when we banned uh, the produce there and, and look what happened there. We were able to end South African apartheid. It's something similar here now because if we don't take action, nothing will change. And it's actually very easy for national states to take this action because Say for Ireland's example, uh, under the public health alcohol bill, for example, we already have a situation where bottles coming into Ireland from other EU member states need to display uh, government health warnings. Doesn't require any new customs check, just instructions to supermarkets and businesses that they have to follow. This is something quite similar here now. If goods from the settlements are outlawed, then it's simply an instruction to the supermarkets and the outlets that they can't, they'll have to get their dates or their vegetables from somewhere else. So I think it's important to say that there's easing mechanisms to do it. And as I said, there's been enormous interest in this globally. Frances Black tells me that uh, she has been invited and has actually travelled to present the bill in parliaments in Norway, in Chile, in the Netherlands. She's been over to the European Parliament talking about it. So people should take great heart from that. This is something that can catch on and become a living reality. And I know people are watching what's going to happen in Ireland. And I'm sorry that we haven't got a government that's able to bring it over the line at the moment. But I'm incredibly positive about what's going to happen in Ireland because all of the parties, bar one, support this legislation. So it doesn't really matter what government gets formed, and we're going to have to have some, this piece of legislation is going to come across the line. And I think that's a brilliant 
um, achievement for Francis Black. It's a great shot on the arm for activists globally. And I think it could not come at a more important time given what's going on in the area at the moment. It's a graphic example of what can be done. I mean, it is shocking. And I'll just finish on this point about the duplicity of the European Union talking the talk and then facilitating and enabling this illegality to continue by continuing to trade. I mean, since in 2015, the EU said that all goods coming onto the European market had to be labelled as being from Israel or from the illegal uh, settlements, but we know analysis of that has shown that it's actually the labelling hasn't been implemented in the manner in which it should have been. But it is positive that just a couple of months ago, the European Court of Justice has said that this must happen and it should be unambiguous. So I think we need to be pre putting the pressure on to look at how the European Court of Justice uh, ruling will be enforced, a timetable for that being enforced. Uh, I think the European Union has to do more. But, you know, while we wait for that, and not wait for it, but while we push them for that, let's everybody tune in to go bring this battle back to their own governments to try and say everybody can do something. And Francis Black is a real illustration of that. One member of parliament having an idea, running with it because it was the right thing to do. So uh, I'm delighted to be here today and to speak for her in the excellent work that she's done on this issue. Claire, listen, thank you very much for that spirited explanation of, uh, of the Occupied Territories Bill from, from Ireland. Um, I see the time is about four minutes to the top of the hour. We may have time for one question. And I'm going to put this to the three of you um, and invite you all to make a very spirited and very close uh, and short explanation. One of the uh, listeners has asked about what, they, what you believe is to be the biggest impediment to peace. Do you believe it to be the settlements? or any other of the final status issues uh, respecting a bigger cha uh, challenge to instigating a meaningful peace process. So I'm wondering if I can put that to you and you can make um, uh, a very short um, ex uh, re reply to that. Anna, I'm gonna start with you if you don't mind uh, um, and uh, give your explanation and then I'll go to Tom and I'll go to Claire. Well, yeah, it's a big question and quite hard to answer in a, a bright two sentences, but I will try. I think that the, I think that first of all, what we need, what I mentioned in the beginning, that uh, we sh should not probably look at any of the cases of the violations uh, in Palestine um, without uh, without remembering uh, in what kind of context it happened and that settlements are part of a uh, of a bigger fragmentation and um, apartheid regime israel uh, pu um, induced on on the territory and palestinian people and it's of course settlements brings a really uh, direct uh, direct imaginary kind of uh, <laughs> Yeah, possibility how this could look like without uh, with, uh, after after annexation and uh, co continuation of this kind of pro pro procedures, and I think what's the biggest important problem and impute it's impu impunity of, of 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 Israel among the international community and among other countries. We have all those tools. We have database. We have the bill, brilliant uh, in Ireland and other laws, which are saying exactly what we want to say. But somehow the implementation is being delayed because of lack of political will and the impunity of Israel. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, that Anna Tom. Sure. I mean, I, I obviously very much agree that impunity is the main general problem, right? I'm, I'm neither Israeli or Palestinian, so I don't think it's my position to say uh, what is the biggest impediment to peace. But on the international legal part, for sure, that impunity. And I think the, the, the International Criminal Court was, of course, initiated with all of this idea to bring an end to impunity, right? And I think what we're going to see in the next couple of months is also going to be quite interesting. Um, because there will not be an investigation, there will be a ruling of the International Criminal Court. And when you look at the definition of the, the International Criminal Court of war crimes and of uh, crimes against humanity, then it is pretty clear that this is going to have some serious uh, implications for settlements. And settlements is something that the ICC is looking at specifically. So at one point, I think really the question needs to be asked to European countries and to third countries. Here you have the ICC 
who is going to conclude, or by the time that they conclude, who has concluded that their you know, settlements constitute war crimes, constitute crimes against humanity, what are you going to do? Are you going to keep really trading with those settlements, providing them the recognition, providing them with assistance, or are you finally going to step up and basically stop, stop that trade as you are obliged to under international law? Thank you, Tom. Claire. Yeah, I mean, look at it. It is a question that would require a lot more time than we have available to us. But I, I do think that the uh, Oslo configured two state process has effectively been dead for years, but the continued settlements really kill it off formally and explicitly by the seizing of all of that. So settlements are a huge problem and they are blatantly uh, illegal. So I do think, I suppose, the solution to having a situation where all Palestinians are, are treated equally and fairly and have access to their uh, resources comes from us trying to reclaim uh, international law as a vehicle, not something to be bandied around as a sort of a convenient fig leaf, but actually as a living process where we can exert accountability and uh, transparency. Thank you for that. And listen, thank you, all of you, for this. I'm going to have to bring this to a close because the, the hour has run. Um, the theme I'm hearing from all of you uh, is that we have most of the international law that we need on this particular issue. What we lack is accountability and political will. And I think that message came through loud and clear from each of your excellent presentations. So on behalf of the uh, European Coordination of, uh, of Committees and Associations for Palestine, let me thank uh, Anna Kader. Um, <clears throat> From, uh, from El Haq, Tom Morenhut from, uh, from Columbia University, and Claire Daly, a member of the European Parliament. Thank you all for these uh, great presentations, and thank you all for joining us. And let's hope that uh, what's been spoken to here today is going to incite action uh, and effective action uh, to one of addressing the issues of, of settlements, annexation, occupation, and self-determination. Bye, bye to you all. <laughs>